I gotta hand it to you, kids. Finding that missing armored car after all these years. But uh, who are these two? Well, well, well. Who do we have here? So, yeah, Dead Aim is just Resident Evil 4. Like all good Resident Evil games, we start with an intro. I swear this is just CSI. I mean, just look at this. Beyond that lies our title screen, eh, fairly simplistic. And for the sake of the viewers out there, we're going to turn subtitles on for the movies. Dead Aim loses some major points here though, as it's the first Resident Evil title to not say Resident Evil when starting the game. We get another voiceover, but... Raccoon City, a midwestern town in the United States. I have no idea what this accent is, if it's southern or just how he speaks, but it caught me off guard right away. Also, the subtitles don't really match what they're saying here. Like, listen. Once again, the threat of biological terror is thrust upon the world. Resident Evil Dead Aim takes place on a cruise, kind of like Gaiden. Here, we'll be introduced to our main character, Bruce McIvern. McIvern? McIvern. Mc... 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 Okay. Also his rival, Morpheus D. E. Duval. As Bruce is held to gunpoint, we'll be saved by a woman in the shadows. You see what I mean? With all the main characters in play, we can play. I know I've been joking about the main heroes in this game resembling Ada and Leon, but that's not the only simulator to Resident Evil 4. Resident Evil Dead Aim released in 2003, so two years before Resident Evil 4 hit consoles. Yet, Bruce's design is strikingly similar to that of Leon. Grey undershirt, ammo packs, and he even got that little Silent Hill light. The more interesting thing is how close this game is to almost playing like Resident Evil 4. So unlike Gun Survivor 1 and 2, where it's strictly a first person view, here it's third person. Not quite over the shoulder just yet, but really close. Tank controls are also still here. You can move up or backwards. But to change your direction to left or right, you have to first point your camera in that direction. Almost exactly like Resident Evil 4. The biggest difference is when aiming. When entering into combat, pressing down your trigger will then bring up that one screen everybody knows. Which gun you have equipped to your left, number of bullets right in the middle, and your health status to the right. I think it's funny and interesting how close they got to the RE4 formula before the game came out. Could you imagine the timeline where this game started the whole over the shoulder craze? It's crazy. By default, you run in this game, but if you hold down A or B, you'll do what's called sneaking. This is a pretty good part to mention that, yes, I am emulating this game, and my control scheme is actually my mouse. Realizing their mistakes in Gun Survivor 2, they brought back the inventory menu, and it's stylized pretty well. We have all our normal options in a Resident Evil game to the side, all our weapons in the first column, all the available ammo in the second, and finally healing in the last. You can carry every gun you pick up, and as much healing as you can. Ammo, however, has six slots. So if you pick up six things of ammo, you need to either use some or can discard it. Assuming the type of ammo you're trying to pick up is for a different gun. Stepping out will be in what seems to be a main hall, and with dozens of bodies littered across. That can't be bad. The atmosphere set up so far is pretty good. There's no real music playing, just the swaying of the ship against waves. Or static with both sets of double doors being locked, one by a key and the other by a key card, there's really only one way to go. And you'll soon find out Dead Aim is quite linear in design. In what has to be a callback, in this room is a hanging woman and around the corner is a lying body that's holding the map of the area and our first key. Thank God. When you pick that up, all you hear is a... So you know, as soon as we enter back into the room, we're gonna get our first zombie encounter. Zombies aren't really dangerous in this game, but they do have this creepiness to them. Flailing arms, and they take a lot of ammo to kill. So like titles before, it's best to just run on by. Quick side note, if you get headshots off, you can one-shot zombies. I unfortunately don't have good aim, so I don't have footage. Do you not see that I wear glasses? 
back in the room with the bodies, we can now unlock this door, bringing us to a hallway. And another opened up room with a lot of stairs, with a painting in the middle. There's really nothing special about the painting, trust me. Stairs are completely nerfed in this game. It does a little cutscene of you going up them, but enemies can't go up or down them. So if you wanted to, you could cheese a little. Going forward, we'll come across some more bodies and scatter notes, giving us note number one, an emergency fax from the Paris branch. Morpheus essentially stole three T-Virus samples as a means to get back at Umbrella. Stashing that note, we'll also find our keycard here. Picking it up is gonna wake up everybody. The good thing though, is that they're quite easy to maneuver around, dodging our way through to get back to our very first big room. Unlocking the key reader door lets us hear this beautiful gem. Five billion dollars. <laughs> yeah, get used to that. There's gonna be a lot of slow-mo shots. This is Fong Ling, another agent sent to get the virus. After some 2000s fighting and this creepy line, What's your name? We'll get some flirting? Fong Ling, that's my name. A typical Leon one-liner, and it's back to exploring the ship. Right over here is a panel wide open, where our keycard will serve a second purpose. Unlocking a few doors. As you can see, there's still a few red areas, meaning we probably have to grab another keycard. Searching down these corridors of relentless zombies, we'll eventually stumble across a new handgun and our first save room. The save rooms in Dead Aim give us more than just a new theme. They give you ammo, refilling you back up to six if you need it. The next hallway we're in has a door swung wide open and what looks to be a VIP. Thanks for the keycard. Back in the spiraling staircase, we can now unlock the other doors, giving us two new places to check out. First, we'll be going to the right. This side of the ship is where the kitchen is located. And what might you find in there, you ask? Well, of course, a shotgun. Also on this side is the pool area, with a few people still hanging around. All the way in the back of the deck is the maintenance key, and a hatch that's missing the valve. On that hatch is a note, telling you where they kept a spare valve at. It's over in the storeroom. Now, if you're starting to notice, most of this game consists of find locked door, run down a straight line to pick up key item, run back, and use that said locked door bringing you to a new location, rinse and repeat. But to be fair, that technically is Resident Evil if you get down to the nitty gritty of it. The only thing really missing is puzzles or riddles because there aren't really any in this game, lending more to action slash horror vibes. I, I also love how back in these older games, developers were like, hey, how do we block the player off here? I don't know, just put down a plant. Once we reach the room with the shutters, we'll see this is where we can use the maintenance key, bringing us full circle to the painting room. It's kind of nice making the ship feel interconnected like that. We'll eventually stumble across Las Vegas again. What's it with Resident Evil games in Las Vegas? There's an unsent letter here from one of the waiters going over how he's happy to be here and ends the note with take care of mother. Down furthermore in the storeroom is a less depressing note from faculty, talking about the presentation room being slightly suspicious. And also our valve. Trying to leave with it, we'll be slapped by some big hands. Fong Ling appears, snatching our valve from us. However, on a twist of things, we actually get to play as Fong Ling, who has an assault rifle, which feels pretty good to bow down zombies with. We just have to run back to the pool deck, where somehow Bruce catches up with us. We'll then get a zoom out and see what Organization 13 has been up to. Dance, water, dance! Oh, they're so beautiful. Welcome to our first mini boss fight, Hunters. You gotta deal with two of them. They're pretty fast and can hit decently hard, but I found running around the pool until you get some distance on them lets you put some shots in. Eventually dropping one and making the second easy by comparison to drop. After that, we'll see Morpheus. We're now down on the lower section of the ship. With no map, we're basically just running forward. I think this game does a good job of setting the atmosphere throughout. Now, I'm not sure if it's just limitations or creativity or both, but running down these dark hallways, only illuminating what's barely in front of you is kind of creepy. We'll find our map and then enter what has to be cargo. Littered around the room are these brown boxes that we could open if we had the right tool. Right outside is a locked door that needs a key card. So we're gonna head over to the presentation room and in the middle of all the broken glass is our key item, but we've played way too many games. That's a trap. Instead, let's have a little look at the note over here. 
This game loves doing the whole put creatures you've encountered or will encounter into the notes. They do it like three times. Elite Hunters, great design. Uh, Tyrant. And mention how mixing the T virus with the G virus will cause quite the electric fusion, almost making you invincible. Almost. Picking up our key item and trying to leave, we'll hear some hills in the distance. The power starts flickering, and what's with his neck? Enter the female tyrant. Design-wise, this is pretty cool, and we'll find out this is actually... M Morpheus? So yeah, according to the wiki, Morpheus is in fact... trans. Cool. As soon as we get back control of Bruce, we're gonna get bicycle kicked. <laughs> I don't know why, but it's just so funny seeing Morpheus try to kick you. Just like the cutscene mentioned, guns are practically useless. So we gotta run, but we also have to open up those brown boxes, creating quite the bit of tension. Morpheus is pretty fast too, and when all you hear is the sound of heels getting closer, it does add some stress. We're looking for a keycard, which is only in one box, right over here. Grabbing the keycard and unlocking the door over here, we'll start running, where we eventually run into Fong Ling again. Some more next shenanigans, and it's up to Fong Ling to unlock the door from the other side. Really simple. All we gotta do is go down the stairs where some hunters are, turn the power back on in the corner, go back up the stairs and unlock all the doors. Saving Bruce, where we get the long running joke of... Don't go. Before you said don't go. What does that mean? Mm, it means you are cool. With Morpheus no longer chasing after us, we can go and check out those newly unlocked doors. The first of which is going to be a save room, the same room we saw Morpheus in earlier. Also, I don't know how, but my game bugged out, and instead of the usual smear loading screen, I got this. Inside the save room is a document that tells us Morpheus got fired. Also, that Morpheus was the one responsible for the outbreak in Raccoon City. That doesn't add up. At least Morpheus got a letter, and a paycheck instead of, you know, killed. <gasps> we'll also find a key here for the recreation room that we can use over in the Las Vegas room. Now we just have to backtrack all the way over there. Not really, we can just go into the presentation room and unlock some stairs. Ending right back up in the painting room. Dark Souls who? This is the most interconnected game. We can just quickly head on over, and most of the doors around here are locked or blocked off, so all we can really go is to the captain's quarters. Inside this mess of a room is a ship log. Seems the ship was harboring something special called the Ones. Making the captain quite nervous. So nervous that he kept his magnum on him at all times. The captain's last log states how the ship has been overrun and he can't call for help. All he can do is accept his fate. And here comes the captain. I don't know if he was juiced up, but he took forever to put down. Only reason to really put him down is because he drops the magnum. Continuing forward, when we reach this door, an alarm starts going off. We'll find Fong Ling inside, captivated by the view, and see we're about to pull a Titanic. We let Fong Ling escape first, following right after her. Time to meet the biggest disappointment of the game. Tyrant. This is by far the goofiest Tyrant design so far. The Tyrant's weak spot is exposed on his back, I'm pretty sure. But the controls are too stiff to really pull it off, so I just stood in front of him and shot him. With Tyrant defeated, we quickly use our action hero escape button to jump off the ship. Seeing the ship turbo int into the cliffside, now this part here, and the music here, oh just watch. This gives off strong rundown city, 80 synth horror music, and we do not get to explore any of it. Instead, we're going down into the sewers. In the nearest save room is another document, talking yet again about more creatures, specifically those they deemed failures. In this part of the document, all they mention is torpedo kits. We'll find more of it later. For now, let's return to our regularly scheduled running down dimly lit corridors. We have to explore down some waterways, and the soundtrack here is terrifying. Literally titled, Scream in the Darkness. We'll find some of those torpedoes the document mentioned. And honestly speaking, walking down these waterways unable to see anything and just hearing fast splashing water is definitely nightmare fuel. One thing here that threw me off completely is this. If I were to ask you what gun this ammo is for, or better yet, here's your options. A, Magnum, B, Shotgun, C, Handgun, or D, Grenade Launcher. You all failed. It's actually for the grenade launcher. With my day ruined, we'll continue onwards until we come across a lift, bringing us into a control room of sorts where we can use the radio. The 
that would make Bong Ling's presence obsolete. Yes, the child would have choose to cooperate with Morpheus. We'll then switch to Fong Ling's perspective and see... something. After the creature is gone, we just gotta navigate through the waterways again. We need to get into the admin room, but it's missing a key. We can find that key on a body tucked away into the corner, where there's another locked door, this time electronically locked. Back inside the admin room, we can unlock the doors and head on over, crossing a couple of more waterways until we reach the lift, bringing us down and to the heliport. Heliport? Heliport. Where Fong Ling literally gets Hammer of Dawn called on her. Bruce then decides that there must be a tracker on her and carves off her skin. Yeah, you, you little psychopath. Fong Lin decides to keep going on her mission despite the recent homicide attempts and says thanks. I think I should say thanks. Bruce responds appropriately. Don't mention it. I'm a Dong Gua after all. After that little interaction, we'll find a save room off in the corner, with that second report, showing us glimmers, basically mutated frogs. I'm pretty sure it's almost similar to that one that spanked billion zero. And we'll find another document making mention of the test subject codenamed Pluto, a criminal who they shoved a metal rod into, removed his eyes, and infected him with a virus. You know, typical Resident Evil shenanigans. I love how this part of the note says the experiment has been suspended, but not because like he died or anything. Nah, it's because he escaped. The main takeaway is that the creature is blind but has really good hearing. Running along some metal grates, you'll see there's not that many doors we can open down here, only the ones that look like this. Taking a lift down and we'll see some guys on fire. Aesthetics, you know? Take Taking one more lift down, we'll find a body that's holding onto the elevator keycard for us. We'll find some of those frogs, a lift, and a few more corners where we'll find the elevator room. And with one look around, this is clearly a boss room. With the one and only Pluto. As you recall, he's blind, so we're gonna blast him. Now, after a certain point, I'm not sure if he got stuck on something or what, but he just kept kind of walking into me until he finally dropped. Fong Ling catches up with us, and we're taking the elevator on down. Some more long neck stuff is going on. Morpheus decides that's weird and cuts the wire. Before we plummet to our death, we're able to get the door open, getting Fong Ling out before dropping us into the abyss. With Bruce lost to the Shadow Realm, we're taken over as Fong Ling. We're in the lab area, and like the cruise ship, there's bodies everywhere. I think the first order of business is to put the power back on. There's a little waste chute we can shimmy on down, bringing us to a lower floor and where the power room is. Switching the power back on wakes everybody up and powers on the elevator, giving us a ride on down. Here we come across a very Resident Evil 2002 movie hallway, then Morpheus will knock out Fong Ling. Bruce wakes up from his nap and this is the last major section of the game. Our goal here is to get to that elevator Fong Ling just used. To get there, we gotta do a couple of things. The note here is gonna help. It's orders from Morpheus. How there's a certain door locked behind voice recognition. Morpheus sent out an email containing just that, but we don't have the means to record it just yet. So we gotta find that first. We'll also find what I believe to be our last research note. A giant fused bug awaits us. Yippee. On the third floor is also a door that's locked by a keycard. To start off our scavenger hunt, we have to go down into the first floor storeroom, where our keycard is, a map, and a memo reiterating that Morpheus caused the Raccoon City outbreak. After blowing up one of the battle toads, we can go back to the third floor. Getting into a room, I swear was gonna have something jump at you, but no. In here is our voice recorder that we can go and use at the computer to get Morpheus's voice. Bringing the voice memo down to the first floor, we can unlock the voice recognition door. Because thou hast obeyed my my voice. We're in the clear room. I think that's what it's called. One of the lockers is opened, holding an assault rifle. Running down some infested hallways, we'll come across this big open room. But it ends up on lockdown, dropping down that mixed bug right in front of us. This is our last mini boss, and one of our final fights before the big boss. Now, not to toot my own horn, but I didn't die a single time in this game, until here. I ran out of healing supplies besides a single herb, not to mention low on ammo, so I kind of had to clutch this one out. Which we do. After dropping the bug, we can go into the research area, where there's a charged particle rifle. Picking it up is gonna unlock the door holding back all the zombies. We needed that open though, because in the back is the backyard key. There's a note here with details about the particle rifle, code name T-Buster. Basically, it's really good against Morpheus. We can now run back to the door that's locked with the chain, letting us catch up to where we last saw Fong Ling in 2002. We find a diary talking about power. Look, Morpheus had a god complex, okay? We can move back the chair, press the switch, revealing a hidden door. Taking the lift down, we'll be greeted to our final save room, alongside some goodies. Entering into the room straight ahead, and it's time for our final duel with Morpheus. Thank 
It's going to be a very costly snake. I swear as soon as this fight started, I just got comboed. I'm sorry, I didn't know I was playing Street Fighter. Don't worry though, I found my own infinite combo. Again, I'm not sure what happened, but Morpheus got stuck in this constant loop of walking forward and then backflipping, uh, until dropping. We'll say Fong Ling, but not before this line. The Dong Hua never met this woman. Morpheus decides to crab walk, and here comes the cool part of the game. Well, after we bear witness to the grotesque final form of Morpheus, a giant blob of flesh with Morpheus' head popping out of the sockets. Cool. Okay, so back to the cool part. It's a giant maze, and Fong Ling is guiding us through it, telling us where to turn and exit. Upon that exit, we have to wait for Fong Ling to open the door, pushing back Morpheus in the meantime. To do that, you just gotta shoot the head until Fong Ling gets the door open. A couple of more turns and it's time for our final fight. We're just gonna do the same thing as we were doing, shoot the head. And like the action hero we are, we finish with the handgun, right down to the last bullet. Bruce's one-liners could use some work. Sorry, but my dance card is full. But this final shot is pretty good. And just like that, both of our heroes uh, die. And credits. Okay, okay, not really. They actually managed to escape. I will say, I definitely thought they were goners though. Bruce tries to get Fong Ling to come back with him, but she decides to stay in China. And we get this revelation. Tom Gua, I'm truly an idiot after all. This face, and... And that's Resident Evil Dead Aim. I think the game speaks for itself this time around. It had a pretty interesting way of trying to do controls, even if it didn't make the greatest landing. Atmosphere was great. Bruce is okay. Fong Ling has zero characterization besides not being mean to Bruce anymore, I guess. But this game is incredibly short, like cutscenes aside, maybe two hours long. Definitely worth checking out. Let me know what you think. Have you played Dead Aim? What's your thoughts? I always like reading them, even if you guys hate the game. Okay, so for a quick little update, the next video isn't gonna be Outbreak. Unless you're from the future, in which case it should already be out. Anyways, timelines aside, we're going to take a quick little detour and check out this horror indie game I've had my eye on. Make sure to hit subscribe, like, and I'll catch you all around at the next video. Take it easy.